Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, featuring speakers from our 2017 event. This podcast features Sean Chabak from Manitoba Agriculture, and his talk is called How to Extend Your Grazing Season in Manitoba. Welcome to Ag Days. Welcome to the beef part of the seminars. And so this afternoon, we're going to talk about extending grazing options. And winter feeding is the number one cost in a cow-calf operation. So what can we do to reduce those costs? And, and with extended grazing, we can cut those winter feeding costs. And when we have six months of winter and six months of tough sledding in Manitoba, winter feeding can get expensive. So I would say that we can strive to extend the grazing season for up to 365 days. So some of the different options that we'll look at in the next half hour or so is stockpiled forage, second or third cut, grazing of hay fields, corn grazing, swath, bale grazing, corn stover, stubble grazing, and others. So is there another way to tr traditional winter feeding? Even though extended grazing is picking up in popularity, the majority of producers still haul their stored winter feed to their livestock on a daily basis. This is expensive in terms of labor, in terms of diesel fuel, uh, machinery, manure removal, and more. So is there another way? So to give you a bit of background, producers can lower their winter feeding costs by extending the grazing season. It allows livestock to return most of the nutrients that they consume directly to the landscape where they are being fed. And feed and yardage costs may be less, but so are your manure removal costs. And manure and feed residues contain valuable nutrients, which improve crop productivity and quality and can extend the grazing season. So Andrea mentioned the Mantle Beef Forage Initiative, which is located, there's two sites. There's one north of, of Brandon at the Brookdale site, and that's at the Brookdale Turnoff. And that's where we've been carrying out a number of different extensive wintering practices. There's also the Johnson Farm, which is just east of, of Brandon. So we held a, an extended grazing season workshop at Brookdale this fall. And at the site, we've been extending the grazing season through stockpiled forage or the grazing of second cut hay fields, swath corn, and bale grazing. And that started in, in mid-October, and we plan to bale graze until the end of May. So in most serious producers who are involved in extensive wintering, extended grazing, will practice a number of these different methods. And traditionally, we look at our perennial pastures will last about four months from June, July, August, and September. And then we start to run out of, of pasture. When the, grazing, when the grazing season is over, the growing season is finished, then we either have to look at stored feed or what can we do to extend the grazing season. And our pasture costs are always going to be less than using stored feed, whether it's providing hay, silage, straw and grain, and other options. MBFI, it's a partnership of Ducks Unlimited, the Mantua Beef Forage Producers, the Mantua Beef Producers, as well as the Mantua Forage Grassland Association, and Mantua Agriculture. And its, its mandate is to conduct forage and beef research to improve the beef and forage industries in Manitoba. So when we talk about stockpiled grass or grazing a second cut or, or a third cut on hay fields, basically that can provide one to two months of grazing in the fall time once our perennial pastures have finished growing. So when we're grazing our hay fields, it's okay to graze alfalfa after or close to a killing frost. Ideally, we want to see a 50-50 grass-hay mixture, which holds its feed value longer and the leaves stay on, on the grass better than on alfalfa. Alfalfa is a bloat concern, so you always have to be on the lookout for that. And that's where a 50-50 mixture works better because we have enough grass in there to help prevent the bloat. If we're getting up above 50%, 75% plus, then bloat is a bigger concern. And alfalfa grass hay fields in the fall time can be quite nutritious. We see proteins in the mid 
mid-teens, relative feed value in the mid-60s, and TDN is uh, quite high as well. Now, when we're talking about extended grazing and practicing it, you have to have a plan B. And falls like we had this year that were excessively wet, we need to have an option other than, say, swath grazing or corn grazing on wet, soft ground doesn't work because your residue and feed losses will be excessive. So an option in those circumstances is to go on to, say, your hay fields that are sawed and will stand up better to the, to the wet conditions and the trampling. And so in this picture here on the right, you can see it's almost like summer fall. That's where the cattle just came off of swath grazing and we would have feed losses there of up to 50%, which is just too high and it gets to be too expensive. And where they were just moved on to, you can see that, that the cattle haven't done any trampling yet. But give it a few days and, and your feed losses will be significant. So that's where you need to have a plan B in wet falls. It doesn't work out real well to swath graze or corn graze if the ground isn't frozen and we have really wet conditions. So this is a picture from a colleague from the interlake and so my question is, is this interlake mud bogging? Is it rice farming or corn silage harvest aftermath? So the correct answer is number three, it's corn silage harvest aftermath. And so we had a really wet fall through a lot of the province and producers who tried to take their corn silage off faced these kind of conditions. And so their, their harvest costs were probably double what they would be normally, pushing $200 an acre, which makes it quite cost prohibitive. So what some producers did instead is they left their corn standing and they either combined it after freeze up or some of them and most of them are, are now grazing it in the winter time. Oops, I'll ask you this question first. Is corn grazing new in Manitoba? Corn grazing was first started, there was research done on corn grazing in, starting in 1921. So even though a lot of extensive wintering, a lot of extended grazing is relatively new, we've actually been practicing corn grazing for quite a few years. Now maybe we don't use sheep as much as was done back then. It's traditionally more with cattle. So when we're talking corn grazing, we can get anywhere from 225 to about 400 cow grazing days an acre. And when, we, when I mentioned cow grazing days, that's for a 1,300 pound cow and that takes into account about a 20% residue left behind. We want a cross fence so we control the livestock access. And that helps to prevent grain overload and that helps to improve utilization. So we want to give the cattle about three to four days worth of corn at a time. Corn is a very high yielding, high energy crop. It can produce a lot of feed on a per acre basis. Plus two, when you're corn grazing, you don't have to start your tractor very much. You save a lot on diesel fuel use. And I know some producers who hardly have to fill up their fuel tanks in the winter time because they're hardly starting the tractor. And the fuel provider kind of becomes like the Maytag repairman where you hardly see them through the winter. But with corn, because of the high cost of growing it, we need high yields. And our average cost production through Manitoba agriculture is about $300 an acre. So based on about eight, eight years of yields, we've seen the average cost run anywhere from $0.77 cents to $1.34 per head per day for the corn. We want to supplement with alfalfa grass hay before moving, and basically what we're doing is trying to fill those cows up before we move them so that they don't gorge just on the corn cobs because when the cows get onto corn they'll move in and just eat cobs so they'll eat as many cobs as they can until they're full so if we fill them up with hay they physically cannot eat as much corn and some producers will even give hay continually so that they always have that that fiber access also providing an alfalfa based hay will improve our calcium because of the higher calcium in a legume and it helps improve in utilization with the protein. And we also need two to one mineral on a annual feed time.
type ration because of the lower calcium in corn and other annual feeds. So when we get set up the corn for grazing, we want to knock down strips and producers will use loaders on the tractor, quad, or it can be mowed. Some people even use their, their vehicles and I wouldn't suggest that you go out there with your Dinelli and knock down your corn, but I've seen where guys will take out their, their Jeep and knock down their corn and, and then put up their fences. So it's maybe not the traditional way, but it works. So when growing corn, good weed control and fertility is critical. In this picture, the corn on the right was sprayed a couple weeks sooner than the corn on the left. There's a shelter belt row right along here, so we were being careful so that we wouldn't spray out the trees. But as a result, if you don't have good weed control, your corn growth really suffers. So fertility and weed control is very important for corn production. So over about eight years of collecting data on some of the corn grazing on producers' fields, we've seen yields range anywhere from about 4.4 ton up to seven or over seven, and producing corn grazing days anywhere from 226 to about 390. And that's where you get your, your range in your, in your cost is just based on the yield. So like I mentioned earlier, the cost range was 77 cents to $1.34. So our proteins will generally run in that 7 to 9 percent. So we'll meet a mid-gestation cow's needs up to pre-calving. Uh, lots of energy, generally in the high 60s. Uh, relative feed values in the 150s up to 190-ish. And at MBFI this year, we had corn that produced 258 to 375 cow grazing days an acre. So it was in that 5 to 7 ton range. So a really good crop. And that site is only about 13 miles straight north of Brandon. So not traditionally a corn growing area, but, but this year was an ideal year for growing corn as well across the province. And we had tremendous grain yields and tremendous silage yields. So moving into corn stover, it's probably one of the most economical ways of extending the grazing season, but it works best if the corn stover is dropped in rows. That way it's easier for the cattle to find the corn, especially after a snow. But it's one of the cheapest forms of extended grazing. If you, whether you grow the grain corn yourself or not, or if you have a neighbor that do, if you can work out a deal that you get to graze his corn stover, then it takes a little less diesel for him to work the field after when a lot of the, a lot of the stover's been removed. Now this works best for cows in mid-gestation after the calves are weaned, because the stover isn't real high in protein. Uh, from some of the analyses, it'll run three to 5% protein, and then low to mid-50s in TDN. But again, we need to provide a protein and calcium supplement. That's where alfalfa hay will work well, as well as a two to one or three to one mineral. Probably one of the most popular methods of extended grazing is bale grazing. And so there's a couple different ways that producers will bale graze. Some will place all their bales out in the fall time. And then you, it's managed with electric fencing. Or what I call more of a modified bale grazing is producers will haul hay out every three to four days, seven to 10 days, and move it around in different fields in different locations. And so that gives, gives you a little bit more flexibility. It's definitely less expensive if you can haul the feed out from your hay field straight out to your winter bale grazing site because you, then you're only handling the bales once or if you're buying the hay you can haul it straight out to your winter site and you don't have to rehandle it and a suggested bale density is approximately 30 to 40 bales per acre and I'll get into the details behind that so site selection is important when we're talking bale grazing and the reason for that is you're importing a lot of nutrients with the feed that you're hauling into the fields. You want to stay back from water bodies or low-lying areas because the runoff off of these sites is quite high in phosphorus and potassium. And we want to avoid coarse textured soils where leaching can occur. As well, stay off of 
any ground that has any amount of slope because of the runoff. Natural shelter is beneficial and economical, and portable windbreaks are a good option. So probably some of the best sites for bale grazing, where you can really improve the, the land, is on marginal soils that are low in fertility. And especially if they have natural bush, like in this picture here. So you can really improve your grass and pasture production through bale grazing from all the nutrients that you are hauling onto the land. When I first started looking into bale grazing and learning more about it, uh, one of the concerns was how much residue or waste will there be? And it can vary from very little, like in this picture, to 10 to 15%, depending on the feed quality, the palatability, and temperature. And that's not going to be much different than if you feed traditionally with a bale processor or if you use bale rings, depending on the type of bale rings that you use. And some producers will even use bale rings in bale grazing. They'll have enough bale rings that they can set out enough feed for three, four days, or even up to a week or longer. And then they just move the bale rings around. So again, that's kind of a modified bale grazing. So pigtails can be stuck into the bales. That can be your fence posts. We want to use a powerful electric fencer because when we have lots of snow like we do this year, snow's an excellent insulator. And then we move the wire about every three to four days. And we can adjust that depending on the weather if the cattle need more feed quicker. So with the improvement of some of the alternative watering systems, that's given us a lot of options when it comes to extend, extended grazing. And we have a lot better solar and wind-powered systems that exist. Some producers, they like to provide water for their older, thinner cows or their younger cows because they have higher nutritional needs. And if they're not getting enough water, then their feed consumption can decline. And that's where we can see those, those higher nutritional need animals start to slip condition. And so that's where providing water will, will just help keep them in better condition. Or sometimes we want to supplement those animals. And, and producers will separate the herd and keep those higher nutritional animals and be able to provide them some grain or maybe some little better hay. And not all cows will be suited to all forms of extended grazing. You know your cows best and you still have to provide a balanced ration. And so feed testing is still recommended. And so you can set out the different types of feed to balance off the ration. You might have some better quality hay mixed in with your, with your poor quality feed. So I'll ask a question, can snow be used as a water source? Raise your hands, who, who believes that or who has tried that? A few people I see that are extended Grazers have used it, and yes, snow can be used as a water source. There are conditions on that. We need enough volume. So this year, lots of volume, not an issue. And also, it can't be iced over or can't be hard-packed where we've seen some of the drifting. So this year is a pretty good year for using snow. So with bale grazing, we would like to see even manure and residue distribution, and that has less impact on grass growth. If we have excess residue, what happens is the grass growth can be slowed or delayed, and that can allow weeds to, to grow in behind. Producers gener generally that have been bale grazing for a number of years, they're not too worried about the residue because it is nutrients that go back into the land. It might be lost feed, but, you, but matter is neither gain nor lost, so it is nutrients that will improve your land and improve future forage production. But we do want to keep that residue to a limit so it doesn't get out of hand. So where we've seen bale grazing take place, spring forage growth will be earlier on the pastures. Because of the higher nutrient levels, and production will be higher. So depending on your bale spacing, you could have these lush rings of growth, 
where there's the high nutrient levels, and in between the bales, your pasture production, if the land is low fertility, will be quite a bit reduced. And so it's, it's neat to see if you've, the first time you've done it, after the first year or two, that all of a sudden you have all this lush growth on your pasture where maybe before it wasn't very productive at all. And essentially it's from all the nutrients that are coming from those bales and from the feed. And it's not crop circles out in your field. So this is a picture of Hugh Blair. He's probably one of the first bale grazers in the Gladstone area. And so learned quite a bit from Hugh on bale grazing when, when I first started looking into it. And so he's been doing it for probably 10 years quite successfully. So he's a bit of a cowboy and he was telling me a story about his buddy who was on a trail ride. So Bob suddenly realized his wife had fallen off her horse, which was quite a relief to him as an hour before he thought he'd gone deaf. So just back to bale spacing, what is an ideal bale spacing? In this picture, we're probably looking at 100 bales plus. So if we space the bales out 38 feet in either direction, that's about 30 bales an acre. If we go 33 feet, and this is center on center, that would work out to 40 bales an acre. Now if we drop down to 21 feet, that would equal 99 bales an acre. So what is the optimal bale spacing? The, the higher the density, you will get better nutrient distribution because all of the land will be covered. When you start spacing your bales out a little bit further, such as 38 feet or maybe more, there's going to be a lot of area in between that, that isn't going to receive those nutrients. But how many nutrients are we bringing in when we're bale grazing? So if we feed 30 bales an acre, 1,250 pounds, at 14% protein, we're importing 714 pounds of nitrogen, 64 FOSS and 542K per acre. And that's not even a real high density. And because only 15 to 20% of those nutrients are retained by the cow, the rest are, are go back onto the land. So 570N, 51P, and 434K is left behind. So if we, so if we up that bale density to 100 bales, we're going to triple the amount of nutrients that we're bringing in. So from an environmental standpoint, is that what we want to be doing? One of the challenges of bale grazing is managing the nutrient concentration because most of those nutrients are basically around that bale. So if you can imagine the, how the cow has her head stuck in the bale, if you can draw a circle around their back ends, that's about the extent of the nutrient distribution. So in each bale, you have 24 pounds of N, 2.5p and 21k, all being deposited in a very small area. So it's really good for, for the forages that are there for increased production, but it's super high concentration. So it's just imagine if you took bags of fertilizer and just placed them out in the field and you didn't spread them. That's essentially what's happening with bale grazing. So can we do better with the nutrient distribution? And you can, and one of the ways is unrolling or shredding the bales you will get better distribution and decrease losses because when we have those super high concentrated rings of nutrients, it's susceptible to leaching or runoff because the crop or the forage will take, it'll take many, many years to use up all those nutrients. And the longer it takes for the nutrients to be uptaken by a crop, the greater the risk is to be lost. So economically and environmentally, we don't want to lose any nutrients we want to capture and use all of them on the fields where, where we're bale grazing. I realize it is higher cost to shred your bales out or to unroll them. But with the improved nutrient uptake, we need to look at is that going to offset that higher cost. And that's something that you as producers can look at as well. So just a couple more methods of extended grazing before I wrap up. Uh, cereal swath grazing can be, can be carried out with oats, barley, or millet. Had a producer this year that even used sorghum because he was worried about grain overload with corn. Uh, you need to electric fence to control access. Nitrates are a possibility, so you always need to test for nitrates whenever you're 
you're using an annual crop, whether that's swath grazing, whether that's annuals for green feed. Wildlife are a concern, especially uh, where there's lots of waterfall or deer. Uh, millets, sometimes used by producers because the deer don't seem to prefer it as well, plus the waxy coating helps to shed water and moisture in the fall time. Uh, we can get anywhere from 100 to about 150 cow grazing days an acre with most cereals, and up to even 200 with a good, good green feed crop. With stubble grazing, our cereal regrowth after combining can be significant, especially with certain colors of combine, seems to be even more regrowth. It's very palatable and very nutritious, but again, nitrates are a concern. So corn stover, second cut, third cut hay fields, and stubble grazing are some of the most economical methods of extended grazing and, and ones I would suggest for you to try if you haven't tried them already. They're relatively easy to do, basically the cost of a fence. And you can get anywhere from one to two months of grazing in the fall time. And the cattle can do quite well and the cost is minimal. Uh, one more caution that I'll throw out there is extended grazing can attract wildlife such as deer and elk. So in areas with high populations, such as along parks or wildlife management areas, it may not be viable. So we've seen areas where we've had high populations of deer come in, elk, and it's not necessarily every year, but when we have a year like this, when we have lots of snow and the wildlife are looking for feed, a standing corn crop is, is a pretty nice alternative than going out and pawing in the bush or, or in a field. And right now, Standing corn that's left for grazing is not covered by crop insurance, where standing grain crop of corn is. So just to summarize, extended grazing is an opportunity to reduce manure disposal costs because there is no confinement. We can cut winter feeding and yardage costs. And increased grass production will improve livestock gains and can extend the grazing season. So with that, do we have any questions or time for questions, Sandra? And we also have fact sheet on grazing corn that we have at our booth over in the curling rink. So you can stop by there and pick one up if you would like. And there's my phone number if you wanted to give me a call. We can talk about extensive wintering another time, or I'll be at the booth. You can stop by there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at Manitoba Ag Days 2018 from January 16th to 18th.